Welcome to the Manure Nutrient Utilization and Water Quality Panel. My name is Sean McMahon. I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa Agriculture Water Lines. And we've got a couple of great speakers here today that I'll introduce in a few minutes. But first, I'm going to say a few words about my organization and also share with you a very exciting announcement from the Iowa pork producers that was just made today. So for starters, the Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance was founded a little over two years ago by three of Iowa's leading ag associations, the Iowa Pork Producers, Iowa Corn Growers, and Iowa Soybean Association. And our mission is to increase the pace and scale of farmer-led efforts to improve water quality. And we're organized around implementing the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy and those goals for reducing nitrogen and phosphorus loss from ag runoff. So we have a number of public-private partnerships that we've started to improve water quality. And one is a project that we're co-leading with the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship that's part of a Farm Bill program called RCPP, which stands for the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And this was new in the last Farm Bill, but it's designed to create public-private partnerships to improve resource concerns at the watershed and the landscape scale. So here in Iowa, we actually put together the largest such RCPP project in the nation this last year. It's called the Midwest Ag Water Quality Partnership. And it's focused on improving water quality practices in priority watersheds around the state. And we actually have over 45 partners and we have over $48 million aligned to improve water quality. We got $9.5 million from USDA and we're matching that with another $38 million uh, from our partners, uh, mostly uh, private sector, agribusinesses, and, and ag associations. So here's the priority watersheds uh, for that project. You can see they involve the larger watersheds at what we call the uh, Huck 8 scale, like the North Raccoon, Upper Cedar, Middle Cedar, South Skunk and also these uh, smaller green ones at the Huck 12 scale, smaller watersheds like Headwaters of the North Raccoon, Elk Run, Walnut Creek, Four Mile Creek, Squaw Creek, Rock Creek, and Benton Tama and Miller Creek. So these are the practices that that $38 million and, uh, from our, our partners and the $9.5 million from USDA is going to go to, things like cover crops, improved nutrient management, conservation tillage, drainage water management, bioreactors, saturated buffers, and wetlands. Now there's another public-private partnership we just kicked off with IDALS, and that's our Conservation Infrastructure Initiative. And the Conservation Infrastructure effort is geared at getting beyond our public sector cost share programs from NRCS and IDALS and attracting more private sector investment to improve water quality. So our vision is that as we scale up practices like cover crops, bioreactors, and saturated buffers, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for Iowa's agribusinesses, really good business opportunities. And there's going to be a lot of economic development opportunities for Iowa's rural communities, a lot of job creation. So for instance, if we look at cover crops, We've done a good job scaling that up in Iowa in the last seven years or so, and we're going to hear from Rick Jukums about his experience integrating cover crops with liquid swine manure application. But seven years ago, it was estimated that we only had 10,000 acres of cover crops in Iowa. In 2015, we hit half a million acres. And we think, this isn't official yet, but that we probably hit at least 700,000 this last fall. So we're really making progress. That's an exponential increase. However, if you look at those 700,000 acres compared to our 23 million acres of row crops, we're still at below 3%. You know, to meet the goals of the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, one scenario calls for 70% cover crops. So that would be 17 million acres. So we're barely scratching the surface. Part of this conservation infrastructure effort is looking at what are the barriers to scaling up 
you know, there's some missing pieces. We're going to need more farmers growing their own cover crop seed. We're going to need more seed cleaning businesses. We're going to need to have innovations like what Rick Jukums is working on, figuring out how can we make cover crops, you know, work with a manure application. We're going to need more custom applicators. We're going to need more equipment, more drills to drill in cover crops after harvest, more high clearance interseeders and aerial applicators to put seed on before harvest, and more channel partners to distribute the cover crop seed. So there's a lot of business opportunities in that. Take uh, conservation drainage, you know, practices like bioreactors and saturated buffers. We've pioneered those practices in Iowa, and we have about 80 of them in the state. Well, to implement the nutrient reduction strategy successfully, one estimate calls for 120,000 of those practices. So barely begun to scratch the surface there. There again, there's going to be a lot of business opportunities for land improvement contractors, for manufacturers of drainage control structures, and the list goes on. So this conservation infrastructure effort is really about getting more private sector investment and also finding market-based solutions and economic drivers to improve water quality. And that brings me to the exciting announcement today from the Iowa pork producers and IDALs that they've announced a new ag partnership to continue to demonstrate water quality momentum. So there's a press release that just came out on the Iowa Pork Producers website, and I'm just going to read a little bit from it. Um, the Iowa Pork Producers Association is partnering with IDALs to offer additional cost share dollars to pig farmers installing new nutrient loss reduction strategies. Through this program, IPPA will provide up to $25,000 to offset up to 50% of the cost for pig farmers to install saturated buffers or bioreactors on their farmland. Sites will be selected based on the greatest opportunity for nitrate reduction and geographically dispersed throughout the state to aid in education and demonstration opportunities. And here's a quote from Bill Northey. Bioreactors and saturated buffers are new practices that have been developed to address water quality. So this $25,000 investment will help us install them at sites across the state so we can continue to demonstrate to farmers how they may be able to fit on their farm, Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Bill Northey said. I greatly appreciate the Iowa Pork Producers Association for making this significant investment. This is another great example of ag groups in Iowa stepping up to help improve water quality. So if you want to learn more about this program, you can find this press release on the Iowa Pork Producers Association website, or you could contact these two gentlemen whose names appear on the screen, along with their emails and their phone numbers. So Tyler Bettine with Iowa Pork Producers, and also Matt Lechtenberg, with the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, who is Dr. Dan Anderson. Dr. Anderson is currently an assistant professor and extension specialist in agriculture and biosystems engineering at Iowa State University. Dr. Anderson received his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin and received his master's and doctorate at Iowa State. Dr. Anderson grew up on a dairy farm in central Wisconsin, where he developed a passion and appreciation for agriculture. His primary interests are in manure management and use for crop production and impacts on soil and water quality. He has played an integral role in Iowa manure applicator training and current manure foam and other environmental research efforts at Iowa State. Dr. Anderson will explain how to put a dollar value on manure how to offset commercial fertilizer costs with manure, and the timing application to maximize nutrient utilization. So please welcome Dr. Dan Anderson. Hey, thanks for having me. One correction to my introduction, I'm not a badger. I actually went to the University of Wisconsin Platteville, and I like to point that out just because <clears throat> Platteville's Famous for one reason. Anyone know what it is? It's home. Soil testing? Oh, it's, it, they do have a great soil testing reason, our team, but that's not the reason. It's home of the world's largest letter M. 
Yay. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, they, they asked me to talk about manure, which uh, I love doing, right? So uh, a few outline of what we're going to hope to try and, try and talk about today. I think all of us face this question. Uh, there's a lot of pressure, and people say, there's just too much manure in Iowa. We can't handle it. And, and we'll talk about the truth or fallacy of that. Uh, they wanted me to talk about manure value, how to put some dollar numbers to it. So we'll take a look at that. And then uh, certainly we just heard some great news about uh, potential nutrient reduction strategy, uh, more ways that pork producers are getting involved. And I think we already are, are doing a lot. Uh, and I think part of what we have to do as an industry is point out the things that we're already doing and make sure that people understand them and that we do care. All right, so this is a map I would like to thank the Iowa Department of Natural Resources for. It's their map of where animal operations are in Iowa. And I, I bring this up for a very specific reason. It's, so each yellow dot on there represents an animal farm. So when you look at that map, I think a lot of people look and say, well, there's a lot of yellow on there, and it looks like there's a lot of yellow in a few key spots. And Doesn't that mean there's just too much manure? And people say, this is a recent problem, right? Things have changed over the last few years, and, and our problem's getting worse. So I thought it would be fun to take a look at that. And certainly I couldn't estimate manure production from buffaloes, so we don't go quite back that far. But uh, I have three lines on here for you. The first one is that blue dot, and I apologize for being in metric units, but it's not too important. That blue dot is what I estimate our crop need for nutrients are in Iowa. And here we're looking at nitrogen, but phosphorus, potassium, they look pretty similar. We've grown a lot, right? Start in 1920, we used a lot of nitrogen. Come to today, we're six orders of magnitude or so higher. So our capacity to use those nutrients, way, way up. And then I have two lines on there related to manure. The first is what I estimate for manure excretion. But as we all know, not all that nitrogen in manure is available. Not all that nitrogen makes it from the time it's excreted to the animal to the field. So after I correct for those variables, we sort of get that red line. And what I want to point out to you there is that despite the fact that many people say we have way more manure than we can use in Iowa, the truth is we can only get about 25 to 30 percent of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium we need to support our state's crop production from animal manures. So people might say there's too much manure in Iowa. I look at that and say there's plenty of capacity for more. We're manure poor. Never at any point in Iowa history have we got less of our fertility from animal manures. All right, now we're going to take a little journey through time. I have some maps for you, because certainly that's what it happened at a state level, but I think it's just as important to think about what's happening where you are. What does the manure picture in your county look like? So what I've done here is plot the percentage of nutrients you need to meet your crop's needs in your county versus the amount of animal manure nutrients there are. So if you would see a red county on there, that would mean we're getting 90 to 100% of our nutrient needs from animal manures, or we could potentially get that. Uh, if you see a dark green county in there, that means we're getting less than 10% of that county's nutrient needs from animal manure, or we could get less than 10%. So if you see a dark green county, really manure poor, a red county, maybe a manure rich county or a county where we should be thinking about, is it the right idea to keep putting more animal operations there? And I will say that my estimate for crop nutrient needs is only crop removal. Right? And we all know that there's going to be other nutrients that you have to supply. Our nutrient use efficiency isn't 100%. Not every pound of nitrogen that we put on goes into that corn crop. So these are very, very conservative estimates of nutrient use capacity. All right, so this was back in 1992. The state looks nice and green pretty much all over. Jump ahead 10 years to 2002, and we start to see a few things start to change. Maybe Sioux County pops out a little bit at us. It's starting to get a little more manure rich. A few other counties in the state start to have a little bit more manure. But in general, I see a lot of counties where we're getting more and more manure poor. Jump ahead to 2012, and the world looks a lot different. I think we all know why 2012 was a bad year. It was a major drought, so when you see those counties in southern Iowa that look really manure rich, well, that happens when your crop production is about 50% of what it normally would be. And you might say, then why did you use 2012? And it's because these match up really well with census of ag years when I can get good data. But I did redo it for uh, 2016 to sort of see what a maybe more realistic picture of that Iowa map would be. And really what you still see is there's only a few counties in Iowa where we're manure rich, or we have a fair amount of manure relative to crop production. Now, I'm sure it doesn't surprise anyone where those are, Sioux County, uh, Washington County, where we have a high concentration of livestock. Everywhere else, we get less than 70% of our crop nutrient needs from animal manures. 
For us, that's a good thing. It means that manure really is a resource in that state. And I like to tell people that makes my job a lot easier when we can sit up here and not just talk about manure has a value, manure is a fertilizer that we can use, but really mean it and live it, which this state does. It makes my job so much easier. So the summary of that is Iowa really does have capacity to utilize all our manure, which really means that we should focus on being sustainable, recycling those nutrients. We do see some areas where we might have to start thinking carefully about siting new facilities or the ability to move some nutrients out of those counties. But overall, we're still in pretty good shape. All right, so manure value. And uh, I think this is a question that uh, a lot of people have is, what's manure worth? If I'm trying to sell it, what should I sell it for? And, and I think the way we always start this conversation, not necessarily the price we're going to sell it for, but the starting point of that conversation is, what's that nutrient value in manure? Uh, so I estimated for a deep pit swine manure, we're averaging about 50 pounds of nitrogen, 30 pounds of uh, phosphate, and 30 pounds of uh, potassium. The truth is, my last year's numbers suggest to me that we're probably closer to 60-30-30, uh, but the year before when I did these numbers, that's sort of where I was sitting at. I looked up our most recent fertilizer prices, so if you look up ammonium, potash, and uh, what MAP are selling for, uh, I have those prices listed. And it turns out that that means that our average swine manure in Iowa has a nutrient value of somewhere around $34 of uh, fertilizer value for every 1,000 gallons. So pretty good, but uh, maybe not quite as good as we've been in the past. And there's a few things I wanted to point out at you, to you here. Uh, this is information from one of our li larger swine integrators here in Iowa about how their nutrient concentrations have varied in deep pit swine manure over the last roughly 15 years there. And there's a few trends that we're seeing. One, phosphorus levels have decreased a little bit. A couple reasons for that. One, more phytase in the ration. Two, more DDGs in the ration. And it turns out that uh, we had originally feared feeding more DDGs was going to lead to more phosphorus. Turns out you guys are all pretty efficient, pretty intelligent about how you balance some of those rations, and the DDG's phosphorus is more available. Let us feed it a little bit more efficiently. But the big thing to me is nitrogen contents of those manures have increased pretty substantially, basically by about 15 to 20 pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 gallons. That's a pretty big increase. If you start looking back at what that means manure was worth every year, which I did, if we go back towards 2000 and we look at what fertilizer prices were, and what manure was averaging for a test, we were valued at about $10 per 1,000 gallons. Maybe not too happy with that. Jump ahead to 2012, though, and we were up in the, the $50 or better on average value for those nutrients in our manure. Uh, so today, when we sit at $30 or $35, maybe not quite as nice as it was in 2012 as a replacement, but certainly compared to the history, we're in pretty good shape, and there really is still value there to be captured. Now, I'm, I say there's value there, but just because that value's there doesn't mean we're really getting it all. And I think that's where a lot of our focus has to, to continue to be. And I think from what I've seen, we've made a lot of directionally correct moves over the last few years to really get there. Uh, but we need to ask ourselves, are we getting those, that manure to the right field? And things like, what's the soil phosphorus test? Is there really value in us putting that phosphorus there or not? Right? Because if we can't get value from that phosphorus, well, when we're trying to sell manure or when we're trying to use it to replace a fertilizer, that's really not cash in our pocket. What about the right amount? If we put on extra nitrogen, it doesn't help our bottom line, and it might even be an impact negatively to water quality. So those are things we have to pay attention to, along with things uh, about the right time and in the right way, and I'll try and talk about those in a little bit more detail. So how far can you guys afford to haul manure? Who out there thinks they haul manure uh, less than two miles? almost exclusively. How about less than five miles? Less than 10 miles? Anyone hauling further than 10 miles? Probably not. OK. So if you look at what we have for some suggestions on what manure application costs, on average, I'm going to say it's about two pennies a gallon for uh, deep pit liquid swine manure. And that's on average. Every farm's a little bit different, but generally that's roughly where I'd put it with an additional cost of somewhere around a tenth of a penny per mile per gallon to haul it away from your farm. So if we start thinking about the value we have for manure, I estimated it at about $34 on average there, and $14 of that was just from nitrogen. If you look at what it would cost us to put on 1,000 gallons of manure, that two pennies a gallon, that's $20 to apply that 1,000 gallons. So if we're only valuing nitrogen, well, that's a net negative $6 of fertilizer value we're capturing, right? It costs us more to put on 
than what we're getting out of that manure. On the other hand, if you look at valuing the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium, well, that leaves us $14 to really an extra value that that manure is providing us. So my question to you is, how far can you afford to haul that manure for $14? Right? Can we look for that field that's one extra mile away where we can use that phosphorus, use that potassium, compared to a field that's a little bit closer? And by no means am I telling you to move all your manure as far away as you can. I recognize that there's time constraints in this industry. We only have a few weeks in the fall, a few weeks in the spring to get this done. But if you can pick one field where you can capture that extra value, there's potential money to be made. All right, a few industry trends in manure that I've pointed out a little bit, but that definitely hold true. One is we have a lot higher nitrogen content, and that's due to both DDGs and less water wastage. And when we look at water manure production or water wastage in a facility, we went from somewhere around 1.3 gallons per pig space per day on average to, as an industry, right around one gallon or a little less. So we've cut manure production, the amount of manure that we have to haul, by about 20%, while still getting roughly the same amount of nitrogen coming out of that pig. So that's made manure management easier because we have a more dense fertilizer product. Now, does it compete with anhydrous ammonia or commercial fertilizers for density? Absolutely not. But we're lucky. We live in Iowa, and most of our manure can really stay pretty close to our facilities, and we can capture that value. The other thing we've seen, though, is lower phosphorus contents. And in particular, when we see higher nitrogen, lower phosphorus contents, I've started to get some questions about, is there really enough of enough phosphorus in this manure. So I wanted to focus just a little bit on phosphorus and how we should manage, manage it. And the questions we need to ask ourselves is, do we really need phosphorus on that field? If we need it, how much? And then how should we know that? So if you look at uh, phosphorus needs in typical Iowa rotations, which are either corn soybean or continuous corn, roughly we want about three pounds of phosphorus to every two pounds of nitrogen other way around, three pounds of nitrogen to every two pounds of phosphorus in a corn-soybean rotation, or four to one if we're in a continuous corn rotation. Well, when we look at the typical Iowa manure today, we average about that three pounds of nitrogen to two pounds of phosphorus ratio. So on average, we're right about where we want to be if we're in that corn-soybean rotation. And that's an interesting place to be. For 30 years, if you look at manure research, it was a question of how are we going to handle our phosphorus problem? We did things like develop phosphorus index to sort of address that question, right? When are you going to be phosphorus limited? The way we've changed pigs is cha has been modified enough that all of a sudden people are really concerned that there's not enough phosphorus in that manure. And I think that's a nice place to be because it gives us some new options. If we've had fields that have historically had too much manure where we're getting relatively high phosphorus tests, this gives us a chance to draw down that level. So rather than just being paying attention to that phosphorus index now, I think it's really to go back, important to go back and really think about where some of that information comes from, and that's your soil phosphorus test. And when you look at this test, if we're in that 15 to 30 parts per million range, we're either in the optimal or slightly high range. And I'd suggest that's really where we want most of our fields to sit. When we get into that manure limited range, when your P index really kicks in, most of the time we're in that very high or excessive range. So what this graph shows is your probability of getting a yield increase by putting more phosphorus on. If you have those high soil tests, there's really no advantage to putting more, soil, more phosphorus on. So all of a sudden, when we think what manure is worth, well, it really is only worth that nitrogen value and that potassium value. We're not capturing that complete value. And as you saw, we're in a point where manure is still pretty valuable, but to really take advantage of it, we have to be getting value from all three of those nutrients. All right, time for a little nitrogen talk. And nitrogen is complex, which makes it a lot of fun and a lot of uh, frustration for both me and you. So when we talk about nitrogen, oftentimes the questions revolve around availability and loss. Uh, what impact does timing have? Or uh, last year in 2015 when we had a really long extended warm fall with quite a bit of rainfall, what did that do for nitrogen, especially if I put my manure on early? So there's a lot going on. Every year is a little bit different. And I'm going to try and avoid any specifics where I say you're going to lose eight pounds of nitrogen if you're early. If you want me to do something like that, you have to see me in private at the image table uh, later this afternoon. And I've been known to say silly things like, I think you're going to lose an extra whatever pounds. But here we're going to try and talk about general risk. So when we pick rate, there's two real versions of how you pick rate. 
Um, and if you look at Iowa manure management plans, the steps they walk you through are the yield goal method. And for a long time, that was the ISU recommended way to come up with application rates for both commercial and manure fertilizers. Since then, new techniques have been developed, and the one I'm going to point out is the maximum return to nitrogen. And really what that is, it's a technique to try and pick out the ideal application rate so you can take the most advantage of the value of your nitrogen. It's what ISU currently recommends, but I would say when you think about using that technique for manure, which it is appropriate for manure, we have to do a few things and think cautiously. The big one being when we developed the MRTN nitrogen recommendation, that's all based on spring fertilizer application. We put a lot of our manure on the fall. So we have to think about really how to go from a spring rate to a fall rate. I put the picture up here. There's a website link right there. This is an online calculator. Unlike the yield goal method where we have to do a lot of calculation, estimate our yield, multiply by a factor, this technique doesn't use that at all. You go to your, this website, estimate a price for what you'd pay for nitrogen, estimate a price for what you're going to sell corn for, and it spits out these graphs. And on that graph, you see basically three lines. The bottom blue line that you see is just a, a straight line there. That would be a line of what it would estimate for your per acre fertilizer cost. The blue line is just the amount of corn it estimates you'd yield times the price of corn, right? So that's your income line. The red line there is really the important one to us. That's its estimated profit line, right? The amount of income we'd have from corn production minus the fertilizer cost. And what you see is there's a peak to that line, and this calculator estimates what the range where you'd be within a dollar of that optimum point would be. So it says, on average, for central Iowa, it would recommend somewhere around 130 pounds of nitrogen per acre on average, but anywhere between 114 to 145 pounds of nitrogen per acre would put us within a dollar of that maximum. One thing I want to point out is how this compares to if you'd use the yield goal method to estimate nitrogen application rates. So every county on there that you see in gray, the maximum return to nitrogen application rate for nitrogen would be lower than what the yield goal method would estimate. Most of the state, right? So in general, this method comes up with a slightly lower version of what we should be putting on for nitrogen. Maybe not a surprise, it's based on spring application, right? So we don't have that opportunity for fall loss. And it says oftentimes in the past we've been maybe a little nitrogen heavy to try and have some insurance on there. And I understand why we, we might do that or why we might think that way, but really I think the future is going to be trying to use this as our recommendation. I think there's a lot of sound science behind it, and in some cases it may be simpler to implement. Now there's a lot of complications, especially as we think about trying to go, go from spring to fall. When you look at some of our southern counties there, the maximum return to nitrogen calculation might even be a little higher than what our yield goal method was. So in those cases, it, it would say, well, maybe we weren't putting on enough with the yield goal method. Timing. Everyone likes to talk about when we should put manure on. And I'm going to show you both this graph as well on the next page that gives you some uh, actual measured data of how much nitrogen we lost with different nitrogen timing. So who here in here thinks that just by changing manure application timing, we can solve our water quality issue? That's good. We can't. It's not that big of a player. On the other hand, I think it is something that we have control over that we need to pay attention to and be careful about. So here's what I'm going to tell you this graph means. It gives us a relative risk of nitrogen loss based on when we apply. It doesn't say we're going to lose eight more pounds or seven more pounds because we put it on that day, because every year is different but it gives us a general understanding of how much riskier it is. So that risk of one would be if you put nitrogen on when your soil hit 50 degrees. If we're higher than that, we might have doubled our risk for nitrogen loss. So what I really want to point out there is that when you start thinking about manure application on September 1st, you might be saying, well, that's really early, but we do see some manure go on then occasionally. Hopefully it's mostly dairy manure or manure where we have lower ammonia contents, but we do see some go on then. And what you'll note is that because the soil temperature is really warm then, our microbes are more active, and that increases our loss of risk. When you combine that with the fact that, well, we just have more time to process the manure, 
it's certainly a riskier uh, time to put it on. And what I like to point out is you can sort of see a, a change in the curve of that line right around November 1st, right? And when you wonder why, why does ISU recommend wait till the soil's 50? Turns out that November 1st, that's normally about when we hit 50 degrees and we see that change in the slope. So all of a sudden when you start to get to that time window, a lot less risky. All right, big thank you to the Iowa Pork Producers Association. This data right here that I'm presenting comes from a, fund, a study they're helping fund. And we're looking at three practices here. Early manure application, which is October 1st-ish. Late manure application, which is right around that November 1st time period. And then early manure application with the cover crop. So we know that in order to get our 10 billion gallons of manure applied every year, someone has to be first, someone has to be a little earlier. Are there practices we can utilize to help offset some of that potential nitrogen loss? So if you look at this curve, what we measured is the amount of nitrogen in tile drainage below our plots. So how much of that nitrogen that actually was lost from the field would have entered a tile line? What you'll note is that that early manure application, that pink line that's on the top, it did lose a little bit more than the late <coughs> manure application. But if you look at what the difference is between those two numbers, we're really only talking about two pounds. Two pounds of nitrogen different. So it's not a huge difference. Now certainly it is a difference, but maybe not as big as some people would believe. On the other hand, I would like to point out that we did see a pretty big difference in yield between those two plots. On the average of eight to nine bushels per acre, where the late manure application outyielded the early manure application. So there might be some economic advantages beyond just nitrogen loss. Then that bottom line you see there where it was really low, that was the early manure application with the cover crop. And in that case, we about cut our nitrogen loss in half. So really an effective, pro pro yeah, really an effective technique for minimizing some of that nitrogen loss. Again, though, in this study, we saw a pretty big yield hit from cover crop in this case. We're not sure why. Right now, we only have one year of data. And I would suggest that maybe it was the most, it was the best year to start this study. We had a fall that was really prone to nitrogen loss. Uh, we, it was warm, it was wet, and that might have led to some of these differences. So we'll see what that data looks like this, this year, the following year, and if it changes a little bit. But a really good sign that cover crops can be effective with manure. Uh, but some questions about what's the difference in yield. And I know one of the questions we get a lot is, should we fly our cover crop on and then put manure into it, or should we put manure on and then plant the cover crop? The answer is yes. Whatever works best for you and your situation. In this case, we uh, put the manure on and then drilled in a cover crop. The reason we chose to do that, this farm had a drill, right? So we could use the equipment they already had. We didn't need to try and do something different. And it fit well with when our farm operator had time. Still effective. So as I look at what we're going to try and do with nitrogen management, if we're going to try and get more value from our manure, we really have to look at ways to try and find a spring manure application window. And I'd like to tell you that the equipment to do that is right there out on the horizon. I've seen equipment that can do it. We have to drive really slow. So it's not going to open up a huge side dress window in terms of large amounts of manure. And when I say really slow, it might be one mile an hour driving speed through your field. There's a lot of uncertainty in manure. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to continue to struggle with. And that's where we're going to go next in this presentation. But we also have to think about potential versus probable in terms of nitrogen management. Certainly we all want 200, 250 bushels an acre, but we have to understand what our weather conditions are going to suggest we're really going to yield that year. So creating some adaptive strategies for side dressing when we need to if you're early applying manure are a necessity. All right, what's new in manure application equipment? So ISU, just this fall, we, myself and uh, Capilla Aurora, as long as with some great help, from undergraduate students and some staff in the back there, probably are, are going to smile here, did some testing of quite a few manure applicators around the state. And really what we were interested in is what's that knife-to-knife -knife variability? I get calls that we put manure on this field and there's a streak where the corn didn't, just doesn't look as good. What happened? And I think we all have answers for that. Some of them are, I, I really don't know. Some's well, maybe that, uh, that knife got plugged with something. But I think there was some, some question about how just variable is it with the, this equipment, especially when we try and go from things like a 4,000-gallon 
per acre application rate down to 2,000 or 2,500 gallons an acre. All right, so we invested in some 25-gallon drums, had the help of a lot of companies around here to do some testing. And what we do is we turn on the equipment, get it to steady flow, start draining water, most of the time we use water, thankfully, into these drums, and then after 30 seconds we'd pull it out, turn off the equipment, measure how much water was in the drums, and say, well, that's how uniform it was. So we tested, what's that, nine different manifold configurations. Certainly not every uh, manifold that's out there, but a good representation of most of them. And we got results that looked something like this. So on the x-axis there on the bottom, what we've plotted is an application rate. And that's assuming a five mile an hour drive speed. So if you would drive twice that fast, certainly we're not, but if you drive twice that fast, uh, that would cut your application rate in half, right? So instead of saying that was the performance at 4,000 gallons an acre, that would be the performance at 2,000 gallons an acre. In general, we thought we'd see things like that figure one manifold right there. When we had higher application rates, variability went down. Basically, we want to keep that manifold pressurized. And we try and get to lower application rates, just not enough flow to keep it pressurized. What we were hoping to see, though, was performance more like manifold two, where even at those low application rates, knife-to-knife -knife variability was less than 10%. If you want to know how any individual manifold performed, that extension publication that I mentioned will have all the data, or you can come see me at uh, the image booth and we'll talk about it. In general, I would say about that, though, if you have a distributor that's using some sort of mechanical means to help keep it pressurized, most of the time that's a plate inside, blocking a little flow as it rotates, those tended to perform pretty well. If you have other styles of manifolds, try and get them mounted as high on the tank as you can and minimize the number of hose loops in your system. That tends to help performance. Also, of course, try and drive as quickly through your field as you, you can while still getting good coverage of your injectors. So with that, I'll move on to the next presentation. All right, let's give Dr. Dan a big round of applause. Okay, so we'll ask that you hold questions until after our second speaker, and our next presenter is Rick Jukums. So Rick is a farmer from Northeast Butler County and also Northeast, Northeast Bremer County, producing corn and soybeans. He also manages a hog operation. Rick is a Soil and Water Conservation District Commissioner in Butler County and a former president of CDI, Conservation Districts of Iowa, which is how I got to know Rick. He's also active in the Cedar Valley RC&D, the Iowa League RC&D, and is a member of both Iowa Corn and the Iowa Soybean Association. He's also the farmer representative to SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, North Central Administrative Council. Uh, Rick uses many different conservation practices on his farm, including grass waterways, buffers, terraces, CRT, CRP windbreaks, and no-till. He's also participating in a cover crop working group as well. And very importantly to this audience, Rick will now offer his insights into how he's incorporated cover crops into his liquid swine manure application. So thank you, Rick. Thank you. There's just a little bit about myself. We uh, farm in, in uh, Butler and Bramer counties, which was already said, and about 470 acres. I actually custom farm another 75 acres on top of that. And there's a listing of some of the things I'm involved in. And... Uh, it seems sometimes I have a lot of hats to uh, change around. We were uh, one of the first recipients of the Governor's Award for uh, Conservation, and that was uh, I was uh, nominated through the Iowa Learning Farms up here in, in Ames. And those are some of the uh, practices I do on my farms. Uh, the terraces I did on a rented farm and uh, talked to the gentleman and then let him think about it for a little bit, and then he asked me if that was ever going to happen, and I said, yes, it can. So we put terraces on his farm and uh, put some waterways in, and he's very happy with that. And uh, the custom farmed 80 acres, we uh, got her signed up for some waterways, CRP waterways, and a bird habitat installed, and also got her started on, on cover crops this last year. This was uh, when I first started the cover crop uh, study with the Iowa Learning Farms. Um, for 
several years I did chop silage and fed cattle. That's kind of gone by the wayside. And uh, this was drilled in right after we harvested uh, the silage. These are just some of the, the uh, pictures of the erosion that can happen. And we had a large rain event this last fall with 13 and a quarter inches. And some of my cover crop we'd seeded three days prior to that where it flooded the uh, cover crop seed left with the water. Where it was uh, just seeded and didn't flood, they, I have a real nice stand of cover. And then the bottom one is, is Steve Berger, which is a huge user of cover crops. And you can see the water running through there, but it's not black. It's not moving any soil. <clears throat> and these are some of the benefits from cover crops. Um, the top one I can really talk to this year, I, uh, I've got some pictures coming up, but I let my rye grow to about three to four feet tall. And uh, when a deer is standing there looking at you and you think she's laying down, but she's standing up, it's pretty tall rye. And I only sprayed that field the one time when I killed the rye and one other time during the, the growing season because I, the rye act like a uh, mulch, a cupboard, so it kept all uh, the weeds down. And there's just, I, you'd have to talk to some of the experts about all the microbial benefits and the earthworms and everything that goes along with cover crops, building your soil new, or, uh, organic matter. <clears throat> and it provides opportunity for grazing. I talked to a gentleman today from southern Iowa that was raising rye, and they turn their cows out right after they get done with uh, harvest, and they've already got a green mat growing underneath the corn. And the <clears throat> cows stay out there. They were still out there here in January and still grazing because it's still open. <clears throat> Enhancing nutrient systems, uh, what I like to tell everybody, it, it scavenges a lot of the nutrients that are put out there, keeps it locked up in the plant that's growing, and as it dies, it releases that for your next growing season. Oop, it didn't go the right way there. This is, I don't know if it's a very big pic, good picture or not, but I was out drilling and I turned around just in time to see this plant, this nest. It's a red-winged blackbird's nest. And that was made with about three rye plants and a radish plant, all wrapped up into a <clears throat> nesting area. So the wildlife does use your cover crops. And this is how I apply mine, is the, ra uh, the ration or whatever you want to call it, how it's uh, the amount of per acre applied. And 38 pounds of oats and radishes go on before corn. That's aerial seeded onto the soybeans in the fall. And then before soybeans or into the standing corn is a bushel of rye and two pounds of radishes. <clears throat> and I use the aerial application. We just don't get done soon enough in our area up north to uh, get a good stand or a good uh, start on your crops, on the cover crop. So most of my, all of mine are done, except for the uh, little green tractor with the old style drill there. That's for our strip tile so that we can get it in the right place. And this is just fall seeded. This is actually growing. And I didn't have a date on there, but it was taken uh, during the fall, right after we drilled, or drilled the uh, rye, got started. And these are some of more the aerial seedings that were <clears throat> uh, October of 15, and then uh, March 22nd. It's got a good mat going already in March. And we had a problem with uh, rape seed. They were supposed to die. And the year we used rapeseed, it proceeded to grow even through atrazine and 2,4-D and a lot of things. If it wasn't actively growing, we couldn't get it killed. And uh, like I said, I use non-wintering cover crops for before corn and then overwintering going to soybeans. And this is where you can see <coughs> streaks going up the hill. I don't know, you can see it. It, uh, that was, those streaks were from the manure application in 2014. 
it grew 200 bushel corn in 15. And this was spring of 16 picture. So all those strips up there is the nitrogen that are, is scavenged and not letting go down the water system. So that's one of my better pictures of, of how cover crops can actually tie up nutrients and keep it from going down uh, the water system. These are just pictures of the, of the rye. It was fairly tall. It was waist high or better. And this is, uh, this is oats, actually. This is in the soybean stubble, and that's just this fall is applied manure. Um, two years ago, we had an early snowfall, and we were using an umbilical cord, and they would not have been able to finish the application without the cover crops there because they allowed enough footing for the tractor that actually the tractor didn't even hardly get muddy. There was enough green growing cover that allowed it to finish and, and get the job done. And then there's just some uh, uh, help to get covered or started with cover crops. There's an equip uh, program that's a three-year program, and there's also some state programs that are two-year. And it's through your Natural Resource Conservation Service. And the state cost share is $25 per acre for a max on 160 acres. And uh, with some of the uh, watershed projects, there's actually some help in your local area. Pulling into uh, cover crops has never been a problem. Um, the very first year they did it, the applicator wasn't quite set up right, so we had a little problem, but they got that corrected and it flowed through. Other than that, it's been just almost like pulling into bean stubble. There isn't any problems getting it through the machine. All right, let's give Rick a big hand for that great presentation. <laughs> okay, so we're going to uh, answer questions as a panel, and I'll do my best to, uh, to direct questions to either of the speakers, but for those of you in the audience who do have questions you want to ask, please feel free to identify which speaker you want to address that question to. And I suppose we can free up one of these extra mics here, too, to um, you know, give it to the folks in the audience to ask the questions. <clears throat> so who would like to start? Well, while you guys are thinking about your questions, I've, I've got a question for Rick. So um, you know, Rick, let's talk about uh, termination dates, um, particularly as you're uh, following your uh, your uh, winter rye, you know, what, what kind of period are you looking for uh, where you want to spray before you'll plant into it? Uh, let's see. I don't spray until it's actually warm and growing. Uh, we've had some problems with uh, producers trying to go out real early and get it killed, and uh, it wasn't actively growing. Like the picture with the uh, drill in it, that was only sprayed the day before, so that was sprayed uh, like May 15th. So it, was, it has a, a really a, long, a great growth spurt about, well, it depends on the weather, but about the first part of May, that rye really takes off. So if it can be actively growing and, and above 60 degrees for about four hours, you can get it killed. Good. Any questions from the audience? Do we have one here? Okay. I have a question. I yeah. think one of the things that people often have a question about is seed selection for cover crops. And I, I saw that you had tried a few different ones out. You want to talk a little bit about that? <clears throat> we, yes. Uh, I started with uh, a cover crop project with Pella Peterson. And uh, they tell me not to tell this one, but it was a continuously green cover which I don't know if you've ever heard anything about that, but it's with Cura Clover. Uh-oh. <laughs> <clears throat> Cura Clover takes this. two years to establish, and it's a very uh, thick uh, root mass. We had uh, problems getting the planter into the ground in that, and I would say not to use that. 
So that lasted about four years, and I still have curra clover growing, and it's been 12 years ago. So it's a very low-growing plant. It doesn't spread, it's, but it's not what you want to use. Uh, we did use uh, rapeseed two years ago because it was per acre, it was cheaper, and we thought, well, it winter kills. That's what we were told. And uh, everybody that used rapeseed that year had it growing in the spring. It did not winter kill. We did not have a hard frost or a hard freeze. We had a snow cover prior to freezing. So the rapeseed grew. And I have a one friend that he started trying to kill it way too early and spent thousands and tens of thousands of dollars trying to kill it. And it persisted because he only kind of pissed it off. And uh, mine, I waited till it was actively growing later in May, and uh, I didn't have any problems with the rapeseed dying. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. There, there's a microphone. Two questions, one for each. You said uh, going to your <clears throat> bean fields, you're using a uh, oats and radish. What's your preferred method of planting that and timing of planting? And then the second question for you is I saw your study on uh, early fall applied, late fall applied. Did you have any insight to offer as far as using N inhibitors in that also? Okay. Um, I apply when uh, aerial for soybeans. Uh, we apply it all in all at the same time, uh, both corn and beans. Uh, I probably, I wait till there's some yellow leaves. Not that they're dropping, but when you first see that yellow tint, that's when you know you can get a good start on your, because the seed will fall, and those leaves will fall on top of it and keep them moist so that you don't have to incorporate your seed. Um, I have, where they've flown around my house and it hits the bin, uh, bin roof, and it falls on the rocks around the bin, rye will grow. They don't need much. They, it, it, it just makes a fantastic mat. All right, and then the fun inhibitor question that I always like answering, right? Okay, so there's lots of products out there, and we obviously don't have data on all of them. And I'm going to put them in two classes, an inhibitor class, so that would be like Instinct, Inserve, where it's a true antimicrobial, and the comment I would make on those is, remember, there's no product that is going to stop nitrification 100%. They can only slow it. Uh, John Sawyer did a study with swine manure near Ames uh, where it got inhibitor, and it was a study very similar to the early late manure study I showed. Uh, unfortunately, there's no tile drains that we can measure in that study. So we only have yield data and then some soil sampling data. And what that would suggest is there wasn't a huge change in yield based on adding an inhibitor. However, if we did put inhibitors in with the early manure in the fall and the late manure in the fall and come back and soil sample right away in the spring, there was more residual uh, nitrate and ammonia in the soil profile. So the inhibitor did something. Now, we didn't see that show up in yield. My takeaway on that study would be if you're doing early manure application, and I'm not talking September early, there's no product that's going to give you a window to get there, but if you're forced to be early, so let's say early to mid-October, it appears to me that the inhibitor would probably have a positive inf impact. Now, we didn't pick it up in the yield on average, uh, but in one of the years, he did pick it up. I think I've seen a study from the Iowa Soybean Association where they had a lot of on-farm trials with uh, Instinct Inserve where there was some effectiveness. And what I would say, especially if you're in a location like southeastern Iowa, where we tend to have a longer, warmer fall and oftentimes a little bit wetter spring, I'd probably be more willing to gamble on an inhibitor. I think most of the data I've seen would suggest that they're sort of break even. They'll work two or three years out of five. Will they pay for themselves? Well, if it's in the right year, it might, right? But I look at it sort of as a, a commitment. You shouldn't go out there and gamble. I'm going to have an inhibitor this year and not next year. In order to make that investment pay off, you probably have to either say, yes, I'm going to do it, or no, I'm not. When it comes to some of the other products, uh, polymer-based products, I look at those more as a sort of a flypaper approach, right? They're not out there to kill bacteria, but they're instead trying to get the ammonia, which is positively charged, to stick to this long strip of gluey stuff that bacteria have a little bit more trouble eating and breaking down. 
As far as I know, there's very, very little field data from a university su to suggest whether or not they work. Now, I have done some lab trials, and I've seen some effectiveness of that product. Uh, would I write home and say, put it on your field? I'm not there yet, but I did see some effectiveness. Uh, the thing that I think you want to keep in mind is when we did early and late manure, we saw two pounds out of 20 difference, right? So that's 10% uh, difference or something like that. If you look at the historic Iowa difference between fall manure and spring manure, fall manure when we're applying when we should compared to spring manure, uh, you're probably only talking about a 5% difference in nitrogen leaching, right? So when we look at a product, whether it be an inhibitor or a polymer, what's sort of our goal for a difference to see? I'd tell you it's about 5%, maybe 7%. All of a sudden, when you start thinking about, can I see that in yield or can I see that on any specific farm, a lot tougher to maybe measure that impact. Fair answer to your question? It was very good. I would support that statement. I think more cost-effective means of nitrate reduction, if our goal is really water quality improvement, are probably long-term practices like bioreactors, saturated buffer strips, or things like cover crops. And building on that answer about the timing, you know, it's very important when you're considering cover crops too. And, you know, cover crops is not one size fits all. So, you know, if you're in southern Iowa, you'll have more success drilling in after harvest than if you live up where Rick does in northern Iowa. But speaking of timing, Rick, I was wondering uh, back when you had, I assume it was a cow-calf operation and you were chopping for silage, my, my suspicion is that you probably weren't doing aerial application then. You were probably drilling it in. We were drilling then. Yeah, after chopping. Yeah. So there is that advantage for timing if you're doing that. Uh, likewise for seed corn producers with that earlier harvest they have an advantage, a head start for cover crops. All right, we've got a question uh, here and then one in the back next. Have you, have you ever uh, tried terminating the ryegrass by rolling it? And if you have, how'd that compare to chemical termination? Ryegrass, you'd have to let it get almost to where the boot was coming out, and that's a little later than, well, this last year I could have done it, but I was not set up for uh, a roller. Um, you'd have to have a chevron type roller so it actually crimps the, the stock as it rolls over it. Uh, there are se several of those out there. Um, guys are putting them on in front of the tractor and running them with a uh, six row planter or a uh, 15 foot drill. But I'm not set up for that so I have not tried it. I've, I've used uh, basically Roundup glyphosate to uh, kill the rye. Good question. I know uh, Howard Buffett has been experimenting with roller crimpers on his farm in Illinois and getting some help from John Deere to design him and tailor him to his operation. Okay, question in the back corner. I guess this would be a cover crop question. Uh, people talk about when they first try cover crop that sometimes they see a yield reduction. Uh, what causes that? So if we're going to get into cover crops, what should we, we be avoiding to avoid that yield drop? The first question I'd ask is what they planted prior. I mean, what cover crop they used, and then what did they plant following the cover crop? Uh, that's the reason for me, for the way I farm, oats into beans. That way there's no competition for the corn the following year. And actually on my bean yields, they've been going up with cover crops because of the rye and the, uh, the low weed pressure and the mat that holds the water in, or actually acts as a uh, mulch to hold the water in. So I think a lot of that is uh, management. You have to decide what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. If you're going to grow rye before corn, you have to get out there at least 10 days prior to planting and kill the rye and have it almost dead before you plant. Um, for soybeans, you could go out and plant your soybeans and then kill it afterwards and not have any yield loss. So there, it, it's a, there's a little more management to it, 
but it's not something that can't be overcome. So I'd like to expand just a little bit on that. So um, during Rick's um, presentation, you know, he was talking about winter killed varieties versus winter hardy. So your oats and radishes, those winter kill. So that's much easier to follow those with corn. That winter rye is a very effective nitrogen scavenger, and it's winter hardy, and it can be hard to kill. So I like what Rick was saying about having a termination plan ahead of time and a big window of 10 days. You know, that way you can be sure you've killed it so that rye isn't going to compete with your corn. Um, Iowa Soybean Association's on-farm network has done a lot of uh, strip trials and whole field trials with cover crops, and they have seen some producers who didn't have that termination plan figured out and didn't have a long enough window between termination and planning that they did experience a yield drag, you know, when they were uh, having, having corn follow winter rye. Um, there are some great studies out of um, Missouri in just the last year about the economic benefits from cover crops and a variety of different rotations and with or without grazing. And what they've been showing is that after three years, there's a good deal of profit and then after 10 acres, there's an amazing amount of profit, like to the tune of $80 and up per acre. But for those first three years, as farmers are tinkering and figuring it out, how to make it work for their operation, you know, there can be some economic losses when you take into account the cost of applying the cover crops. But, of course, we do have cost share programs to help cover those costs. But, you know, Rick, if you wouldn't mind in your... Uh, you know, early days of uh, cover crop applications as you were figuring it out, you know, did you notice any any yield drags on your operation? For mine, there was no yield drag because I did terminate it early enough. I had that figured out before I got it started. Um, the Iowa Learning Farms this year had two cooperators that had an increase in corn yields with cover crops. So it's starting, I, I think those were in their probably fifth year, fourth or fifth year. So the longer you can do it and the longer you're in it, I think there is, is uh, a great benefit, and I think you'll start seeing your yields increase. There, mine have not, the corn has, there's no significant difference on any of mine where I've done the uh, corn following cover crops. And like I said, the last two years, my soybean yields have gone up. And a, a follow-up question, have you noticed your, uh, your inputs going down with cover crops? Can you get away with applying <clears throat> less fertilizer? I'm not ready for that yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I, I think our soil tests are going up. Um, the chemical costs have gone down prior because of the one pass instead of two passes. Mm -hmm. um, there are some significant increases in, in uh and soil quality that you can start to feel now. The, the soil is almost soft when you walk on it. It's, it's almost spongy. Um, I, got, I was pushing out some trees on a fence line on mine, and the skid loader was leaving, I don't know, two, three-inch grooves where it was running, and I went over because I pushed the tree over. It went over in the neighbor's, so I went across the fence onto his work ground, and I couldn't leave a mark with the skid loader. You could see where it went, but there was no... No sponge. I mean, it was, and the water infiltration, that's another one of those things that you can talk about cover crops. The roots on your rye go down about three, four feet. So the water infiltration will follow those roots down into the ground, and it will absorb a lot more. There's a lot more capacity in your soils to store water. So that hopefully, in the long run, will equate to a higher yield. The ISU studies on maximum return to nitrogen with and without cover crops on some sites that we've had going for 10, 12 years haven't shown much of a difference for what your ideal nitrogen application rate would be. As far as yield drag, I think most of the Illinois data is showing that it's no yield drag or yield benefit. A lot of the Iowa State studies have shown maybe the opposite of that, no yield change to, to maybe a little bit of a yield drag. But I think a lot of it does come down to management, and, and most of the agronomists I talk to on campus think that even in situations where we've seen yield drag, there's things that we can do to, to manage our cover crops a little bit differently to sort of take care of that. And unfortunately, we don't have the right answers for you right now, but that's, that's an area of study that they're actively pursuing because we recognize the importance. 
Um, one thing I would just add to that that answer that Rick provided is, um, you know, he did mention how, you know, having cover crops will improve your infiltration rates and your porosity. Well, it'll also improve your soil organic matter, as will no-till and strip-till. So as you're doing that over time, you know, increasing your soil organic matter, that will increase the uh, water holding capacity of the soil, which will help with resilience for seasonal climactic variability in drought. Um, in 2012, it was said that, you know, no-till operations, you know, had a 12 uh, bushel per acre yield advantage over conventional tillage because of that resilience, and you see similar effects with cover crops. All right. Um, oh, we've got the mic over here, then we'll go to the middle. Yes, yes. sir. This is... You're on. It's on. I'm on. This is for Dr. Dan. It's an equipment question. On uh, We strip till with a manure tank. Have you done research on the length of hoses and the amount of volume with the full manifold pressure uh, that comes out of those hoses? <laughs> kind of. You, you saw some basics of it right there. Uh, every manifold is a little bit different about when it's going to lose its pressurization, right? In order to get uniform flow, uh, you want to keep it pressurized. Now, the length of the hose from the manifold uh, down to your knife, oftentimes we've said that we want to keep them equal, right? Because when you think about uh, even pipe flow, we often think friction loss in the hose. Well, the truth is, when you're going from your manifold that has a slightly pressure, that's slightly pressurized, hopefully, out to an area where it's at atmospheric pressure, if you look at that hose, rarely is it ever full, right? All of a sudden, hose length isn't so important to me. It's more along the lines of, uh, do you have swags in there where you're getting water to pool, manure to pool, and sit? And that's what concerns me more than actually the exact same length of the hose. That a, that a good enough answer for you? Okay. Okay, I'm here in the middle. Yeah, I was curious about the benefits or slash complications of applying manure within uh, in cover crops, like your rye. Uh, is that difficult, or what are the advantages? Uh, can you talk about that? Um, we've just been applying uh, uh, manure to an oat seeded on soybean stubble. So it's... There has not been any problems with it whatsoever. It handles it very well. The oats are attached to the ground so they don't move. Um, uh, it's been really interesting to watch them green up after the manure has been applied. And uh, this year was very nice because we had uh, almost a week and a half before it frosted, hard enough to kill the oats. So they actually absorb some of the nitrogen right off the bat. So some of that is tied up in their root system, so it won't be available till this when they start to decay and, and uh, give that to the next crop. Do you use knives or what's your... Uh, the, the umbilical cord was a knife applicator, and the one we had this year was uh, just a fluted disc injection. And I would say lower disturbance, either knives or uh, vertical till injectors, tend to cause a little less cover crop damage. So if you would be going into, let's say, cereal rye instead of oats, uh, or if you were going into oats early, damage might be more important to you, right? So having something that's more of a, a no-till applicator probably makes a little bit di more of a difference. Um, hopefully we're going to have some field days to demonstrate the impacts that a, a few different injector types have on cover crops so you can see it. Yeah, and I, I would just add, I'd put in a plug for Iowa Pork Producers Association that they've had a couple of, um, of field days looking at different equipment and low disturbance knives. And actually, Dan was up at one last September up in the headwaters of the North Raccoon, uh, that priority watershed, and IWA is involved in that as well. And there were big differences, you know, among the different equipment. So I think uh, a lot of companies have uh, seized on to this. A lot of companies recognize that there's going to be good economic opportunities around cover crops, and they really want to partner with the pork sector to figure out, you know, how can we innovate and get this uh, application of liquid swine manure to work in the fall in a cover crop system. It's a very good question. Any other questions? We still have about 20 minutes left for this panel. Gene. It's for either one. Um can you define what a hard frost would be for a cover crop? Just it, give a definition before you give the answer. And how much time do you need for this oats to take hold before that hard, hard frost? You want me to define it? You go right yeah, it looks like, it's Dan. <laughs> looks like it's Dan. All right. 
I would tell you that a hard frost is a killing frost, right? And you make a good point in that it's a little different for every crop, right? Some crops are more winter hardy than others. And whether or not the winter kill, rapeseed for example, it's based on USDA zoning and we don't always hit that winter level of hardiness, right? Some winters are worse than others or some winters we get snow cover and we insulate our soil basically so we don't hit that, hit that hard freeze where it's, it's the killing level temperature for it. So that, that's the, the extension answer of it depends, right? Which is the one that I'm told to <laughs> give more often. <laughs> um, but I think with oats, as long as it's up and germinated growing, in a typical Iowa winter, we're going to kill it. This year, we actually had a snowfall on our oats. And then it melted, and it still was green. Yeah. And then we applied the manure. So 28 degrees or something like that for a certain amount of time. There's a whole thing you can get out. But what? No. Cough. Okay. It's, it, it's a killing frost. I, there's a certain time limit that it has to be a certain degrees to kill a certain plant. Uh, you'd like to have some growth. That's why we put it. I, usually I'm seeding mine, aerial seeding oats. Now, radi or, uh, cereal rye, I've actually got some frost seeding going on, so it'll come up this spring. So that'll actually, it'll be a cover crop, but not like I'd like to have it. I'd like to have it up and growing in the fall and green mm -hmm. so that it is actually absorbing some of the nutrients that are left over and keeping them. And the root system is what keeps the soil in place. So if you can get it up actually green, when you're combining, my sickle turns green, my auger turns green from the oats coming in. They're already three, four inches tall, six inches tall. So yes, you want them up and especially your winter kill variety, you want them up and growing so that the root system's there to hold the soil. More growth tends to lead to higher reduction, but uh, our study's up at Nashua, so it is in northeast Iowa, and we're drilling in after harvest, right? And, and we still got 50% reduction, but you do need some growth in the fall. Yeah, just one additional comment is your winter hardy varieties like rye you're going to get a better soil conservation benefit in the early spring. You know, when, you know, in recent years, we've been having, you know, more intense and more frequent rain events. So, you know, there are some, some different benefits to going with winter hardy as opposed to uh, winter kill varieties. Um, other questions? All right, going once. Going twice. Any other questions? All right. Well, I would just remind folks, um, if you're a pork producer who's interested in a bioreactor or saturated buffer, thanks to this great new announcement from the Iowa Pork Producers Association and Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship, you can get basically 100% cost share, half from IPPA and half from IDAL. So if you're interested in a bioreactor or saturated buffer, Go to the Iowa Pork Producers Association website or contact Tyler Bettine or Matt Lechtenberg at IDALS. And that effort ties in with that conservation infrastructure effort that I was talking about earlier today. We're really trying to scale up those edgy field practices that are extremely effective at reducing nitrate concentrations, particularly where we've got the subsurface drainage or, or tiling. You know, Iowa farmers have made phenomenal progress when it comes to reducing soil erosion. You know, we cut that by 33 percent between 1990 and 2010, and we've been reducing phosphorus concentrations in our waterways on average over 2 percent per year for the last couple decades. But nitrogen is a tougher nut to crack. You know, it's soluble. It moves with the water. We've pioneered those practices of bioreactors and saturated buffers right here in Iowa. Now we need willing farmer participants to help scale them up. You know, likewise with cover crops, you heard we've, you know, we might be at about 3% of our row crop acres. We need to be closer to 70%. Having pork producers here in this audience, you know, figure out how they can, you know, do like uh, Rick did and make it work for your system, you know, for your fall application is what we really need. So I'd encourage you to, to consider that. But let's uh, end by giving our, our uh, presenters uh, another uh, big round of applause. Thank you.